Es ist Zeit für die dritte Dimension. Look behind you at three-headed Gru! A rather pixelated pirate calls out as you descend the cavern into an equally pixelated cave. You can't fool me with that old trick, you think, but there is a strange chill in the room. You run toward the light at the end of the cave and emerge on a beach where an old hermit sits alongside a parrot. I know the secret, says the parrot, but flies off before you can hear any more. As the parrot flies before your eyes, the world turns from 2D pixels into a series of more and more complicated polygons, then morphing into a beautifully rendered 3D scenescape. As the pixelated world around you shifts from 320 by 240 resolution, getting ever more complex, you reflect on your life and the simpler days gone by. It reminds you of the church where Peter Essenyi is about to talk. Awesome. Hello. Um, hi, my name is Peter. Uh, I don't even try to pronounce the second part of my name, it's SNE if you want to know, but it's really hard to say, so yeah, Peter is fine. Um, I live in London, I work in London for a company called Territory Studio, and what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is going to be how we do stuff for films. We basically specialize in doing um, user interfaces for various films, big ones, small ones, uh, you might have seen a few of those. The last one that we did was the Avengers, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So, um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I think I'm going to be the guy who provides the light entertainment, because you guys are, you know, you know much more about coding and, and, and serious stuff than we do. We just do the, the superficial light stuff. So I hope you're going to enjoy it. Let's do it. Right. So the company that's called Territory Studio was founded in 2011. It was founded by three guys. And we started doing, you know, motion graphics stuff. We started to do branding and digital design as well. It was a very small company. And then we started to grow. And right now, we have 12 full-time employees. Um, at times when we have to work on a big film, it goes up to like 30 people. So um, we use quite a few freelancers. A nice one. I really love that. Um, yeah, all right. Is it happening? No, really. Do I have to do the car trick instead? OK. Don't worry about it. I'm going to say a few words. Yeah, these are the films that we worked on. Um, the first big one that, that, that was pretty nice for us was Prometheus. You might have seen that one. Um, a few words about that. Ridley Scott, we all know him. He's a genius director. Um, he came up with lots, of, with lots of ideas how the UI should look like, and we used those ideas. Um, I don't want to talk about the film. It was as it was. But we did uh, some very interesting stuff on it. And then we did Zero Dark Thirty, which is a very different thing. It was based on real world stuff, drones flying above uh, different, uh, different places. So it was, it was much more grittier and, and down to earth than Prometheus. Then, based on that one, we did Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, have you see, ha did anyone see Guardians of the Galaxy? Nice. I think it was, it, was a, it was a good film. It was really funny. It was, you know, not the usual Marvel big stuff. It was much more, you know, sci-fi meets Marvel. Always good. And then we did 
Ex Machina, which is a... Was it shown here? Was it in Germany? Did, did they show the film in Germany? It's a film by Alex Garland, who did The Beach. He wrote the script for The Beach, and that was his first film, and it deals with artificial intelligence and how robots take over the world. It's a very small, very beautifully done film. I'm going to say a few words about that later. So, what is it that we do? The one on the right, I think everyone recognizes that. And that's the essence of what we do in films. It tells a story that's kind of hard to tell with words. When you see that thing on the right, you know that, you know, you have a certain distance to do something that's got something to do with that little thing in the middle. That's it. Directors like that stuff because it's very easy to show. Just a quick cut to that screen and it immediately tells the story. And that concept was taken a level uh, further with Minority Report, you all know that kind of thing. We, I just had this discussion earlier that it's not really working in real life, is it? That's going to be really hard work to do something, you know, just open my emails like that. That's not going to work. And Iron Man on the right, that's, that's you know, lots of information on a very small, in, in a very small space, uh, very nicely done. And in the case of Iron Man, the um, user interface sort of like uh, delivers more stuff about the story that, you know, quite important and, and, and almost becomes like a, a, a secondary actor to the main actor. Um, so this is what we do. This is uh, what we specialized in. And um, a few words about how we do it. A lot of people think that all uh, we do is just sit in a studio and when the film is ready we get the plates and we come up with stuff. That thing behind me shows that that's partially true but partially not. We do lots of stuff on set and that's called on set delivery and what we do is we start to think about how the UI should look like, um, what's, the, what's the point that it wants to take across what the director wants to show and we come up with designs you know iterate through those designs and then you know with a company um, that we work with called CompuHire we help build these sets and we set up the UI screens to be on set so the actors are able to to use them to a certain extent obviously it's not really going to work the way it works in a film, but it's really nice to have something that the actor can touch or, you know, manipulate to a certain extent that helps them to act instead of just, you know, imagine there's a green screen and you have to sort of pretend that you are reading a very important email. I mean, like, if you're a good actor, you can do that, but I don't even try to do that. Don't look at me like that. Um, it's much easier for them. The directors love it because it gives a sense of reality to the whole set. You know, the lighting that comes from those screens really lights up the actors. And, and we just noticed in the past couple of um, occasions that they really like to sort of like blur it in the background behind the actors because it looks interesting instead of just having a wall or ha having something that's flat. So some of the stuff that we do which you might be uh, able to see are quite detailed, become just, you know, some, some, a blurred, nicely lit wall behind them, which is a shame in a sense, but that's, that's what we do. So, the first thing I'm going to say a few words about is going to be this, mouse. What's mouse? It's a very, very small, short film, uh, done on basically no budget. And the reason I'm um, going to talk about it is just to show you how it works throughout different scenarios. So in this case, we had basically very limited resources in terms of time and people and, you know, what we can do. Uh, and what we did, we used everything that we could get our hands on to do interesting stuff. So what these guys did, um, when they filmed the production, they had a Kinect connected to the camera and they were recording all the depth data that they can, you know, get just to illustrate how it worked. So they filmed a plate of the motorcycle just going across the track 
and you got all these depth data. And from that depth data, we were able to create 3D models, which is like, you know, it's a nice, nice hack. It was used quite often uh, in the past couple of years, but it's a really nice way of like getting something more out of that fairly simple DSLR-based shot. So the idea of the film was that there's a, there's a robot dog or something like that that was built by the American army, and it's, it's just sort of like gone away. And it becomes friends with a guy who's a motorcycle rider, and they do something. Um, we did not write the film, but we really liked the concept of being able to come up with ideas that how this robot dog sees the world. And that was the concept that we started to uh, work with. It was like, you know, we have to show, we, there were like, I think, four or five shots when we had to show how this thing sees the world. And, and uh, the good thing about this being a very small budget film was that we could say that, all right, just give us the freedom to come up with something that we can come up with. And we got that freedom, so we started to experiment. We got the 3D data, we got the, the 2D film plates. So we started to think about what happens when, when a robot dog is sort of like, uh, it meets someone or somebody. And um, does it need to see like human forms at all? Or, or you know, what's happening when, when we see the world through the eyes of this creature? And obviously we went uh, bonkers and it was like, yeah, we don't even have to show anything that resembles a human form. We just show like code or data or points that look very different. We just show a, a simple triangle and that represents everything that this creature can see. And you know, some of the ideas were really, really interesting, but obviously we are talking about a film and the film usually, if we are lucky, has some sort of an audience and it's kind of hard to grab their attention if you show like a triangle for 30 seconds and say that this is how this creature sees the world. So we had to come up with something more interesting and we started to see, I don't know if you were able to see that, but these are basically point clouds based on the 3D data that we got. Various different patterns, various volumetric representations of the data and we just, we just play with it, just make it look nice, make it look a little bit different. And the, um, the director liked the idea, and we got some feedback, and we started to play with it a little bit more. So we added like topological lines, we added like just data on top of this whole thing. And I think at the end we got to this one on the right, that was the final look. And if you are interested, I can show you how it looks in that shot, if that plays behind me. So this is, this is how that robot dog sees the world. Um, I tried to play it again, if it plays. Nice. So that's roughly two seconds, and we worked on it for like a couple of weeks. We really liked it. I hope it comes through. <laughs> I ho hope the enthusiasm com comes through this uh, picture. So we did this thing with it, and then there were a few other shots where we had to develop a look for the holographic dog, which we're gonna build into a UI that's gonna be used by someone who's, you know, sinisterly driving this dog. We don't know the real story of the film yet, uh, but we sort of like, we were interested in taking part of it. And this is how it ended up. So this is the UI that we did for this. Um, that's the holographic dog in the middle. Does it work? I feel a bit like Madonna with this. I hope it works. So, yeah, what you see on the right and the left, these are just, you know, that's, that's just interesting stuff. It, it doesn't mean anything. It just looks hopefully good. And it's got, yeah, that's a really hard job to do. I don't know where my glass ends and this thing starts. <laughs> All right, as long as you can hear me, I'm fine. Um, 
So yeah, that was Miles. Um, we did some traditional UI stuff on screens, uh, which were you know used in, in more traditional shots. But these were the main things. And the really good thing about this project was we could we could experiment with stuff. We could come up with crazy ideas, which on a bigger budget production is not really uh, happening too often. So if you're interested, there is this little uh, movie on the internet. You can watch it. And it was picked up by some big Hollywood uh, studio. So it's going to be turned into a proper big budget film. And we're really happy to be part of that really interesting process. I don't know if you know too much about that, but these days, uh, that seems to be the way things are working for, for filmmakers. So instead of just writing a script and trying to convince people to finance your script, it's usually getting a few people that you love to work with and just make a few shots that look a bit like you know, the, the finished film that you want to do and then try to sell that to the people who finance films. And you know, if it's good and if you're lucky, then you know, it probably gets picked up. I've heard a few cases in the past couple of um, years about that. The next one, Ex Machina. Um, so as I said, this, this film is about artificial intelligence. It's about a robot. I, I don't know. Do you want me to spoil the film or do you want to watch it? OK. Don't, OK, cool. All right, fair enough. It's going to be really hard to do. But yeah, I'm not, OK, I'm not going to uh, talk about it. It's about a guy who's running a big software company that does a big, uh, that creates a big search engine. We've never heard of anything like that. And there's another guy who's a really, really good coder. And he works for this company called Blue Book. And one day, he gets an invite from, from the top guy to take part in something interesting. And that was the premise of the film. And we really liked it. Um, we got the script. We, um, just one thing before I go further. Do we know the time? Because this seems to go back to 30 minutes. I really love it. Because it seems like I have all the time in the world. But I just want to make sure that I'm right on time. So um, where about are we? 10 minutes-ish? Cool. Um, so when we read the script, it was really interesting. Because the, the, the ideas that we had to do, we had to deliver, were coming up with an, an operating system something that looks like an operating system, not a proper one. Um, and we had to do a bespoke operating system for this guy, this, this very rich, powerful guy. And we had to develop some schematics for, for robots, which is like, you know, that's, that's a childhood dream, isn't it? So we started to experiment with stuff. It, this thing was based on reality. So when we started to design the UI, for this. Obviously, it needed to resemble something that, that might work. So we had buttons, we had like windows, we had stuff. And we had on the right, my, my right, your left, uh, lines of code. And you guys know code much better than I do. And I don't know if it makes any sense. And you know, this is a very, very tricky thing. Because when we do something like this, there are people out there who really, really pick it apart. And that's the first thing usually on the internet. What's that shit that those guys put into that window? So in this case, we hired a few guys to come up with code that actually makes sense. I don't know. This is one of the style frames that we did. So the mod might not be the case in this one. I don't even start. <laughs> but yeah, I think, um, so we developed this. That was, that was Caleb, that's, that's the main actor. Caleb's um, computer, he had a search engine, and he had some windows that he does code in, because that's what he does for a living. And obviously, he had to do some emails. So that's, uh, that's an email system with some 
servers, browsers, folders, and downloads. And what else do you need in an office? Here's the answer, spreadsheets. So we did spreadsheets. Um, I just, on the way here on the plane, I just read what's in there, and it says, pack, pose, body, joints. Don't ask me who did that there and why and what does it mean, but this is, this is Blue Book. This is the Blue Book operating system that we did um, for this film, and this is how it looked on set. So we had a nice office. I think it was filmed at the Bloomberg offices in London. So they had a few computers. They had like people work, pretending to work on those computers, and everyone loved it. Um, and then the next thing that we had to do was this guy called Nathan. He's the, he's, he's, he's the powerful guy. He's the bad guy. He's the good guy. I don't know. That's his, his own personal computer. Obviously, he's the top most coder in the world. He's the baddest coder in the world. So he has a big coding window. And he has like stuff, like host grid sys and main host sys and stuff like that, which is, I think, that's, that's proper, isn't it? <laughs> or at least that's what we thought. So um, the funny thing about this was, I don't know if you've seen films where people pretend to work on computers. They don't really use m the mouse because that's not really interesting for, for a film. You don't want to see a guy just doing that. What are you doing? Mm, you know, hacking the system. <laughs> that's not, that's not, not, that's not super interesting. I'm not saying that typing furiously on something for five minutes is more real, but using a mouse and trying to make it work like this is not really, not really a good idea. So the director decided quite early on that he doesn't want to um, use a mouse. So everything was controlled by uh, keyboards which someone just said, it's actually possible, which is a whole new world for me. Um, if, if you're interested, I can show you later when the presentation finished that how actually this looks on set. I have a file that we used on the set of this film that was uploaded to the computer on set, and the actors could go there and pretend that they are doing stuff. It's fascinating. Every now and then when it comes up in the office, everyone sort of like wants to have a go because it makes you look really, really cool. You just type there and Jesus Christ, I'm in. It's amazing. So that's what we did. This is how it looked like on the film. It wasn't as dark, but you know, you get the idea. He had a few computers. He was controlling everything in his house. Uh, there are the code bits. We had some security screens in there and stuff like that. And the funny thing that happened later, which we all really wanted to take credit for, but we, we, we couldn't because we did not do it, but someone else did it on this film, is someone just pointed out that one of the scenes in the film actually features a code, and I have to call this. If you run it in Python 2.7, does it make sense still? So, right, cool. The result of this code is the ISBN number for a book called The Embodiment of the Inner Life, Cognition and Consciousness in the Space of Possible Minds. <laughs> and that's, that's an actual Easter egg, which, which was hidden in the film by someone else. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't do it, but I think it's cool. So, um, yeah, that, that was my biggest fear, that one of the guys who we worked on the film with just hides something there that, you know, they are pricks or something like that. And, and we don't pick it up and the whole code community just picks it up and ah, 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 does that. So thank you very much. You in general, not, you know, screwing with us in that film. So um, the next thing that we did in this film was a flat back robot. Um, Haynes manual, you know, all these exploded diagrams of, of, you know, car parts and stuff like that. That was the main idea behind this. So we got the model from uh, DNEG, I think, uh, I think it probably was DNEG, one of the big VFX houses. And we took it apart and we did those diagrams 
because that's what the director wanted to have in the room when they are actually assembling the robot. And the funny thing about this was it was a really beautiful, really nicely modeled 3D robot, but when we took it apart, it just looked like, you know, it, it looked, there wasn't anything there. It was made out of, I think, 200, 300 parts, and it looked very bad. So we had to sort of like add little nuts and bolts and all sorts of little details. So we went through the archives and got everything that resembled anything that's got to do with a robot, and we just scattered it all over the place. So I think some car parts are in there and, and, and all sorts of little stuff. And these bad boys were printed in, in a huge size, and they were used in the film like this. It's behind them. And that little barcode on the top, that's pure IKEA, isn't it? I'm really proud of that. <laughs> I had to assemble so many IKEA furniture. That was my revenge. It's in there. Brilliant. So um, the big thing about this film was that it was, it was you know, it was a, a, a quite a big budget film compared especially to the previous one. But it still wasn't the big Hollywood all-out blockbuster. But it was really good to work with the guys. It was down to earth. It was a fairly small thing. We had a bit of creative freedom with working with the production designer and the art director. Usually the way we work is we get involved in the, um, in the early stages of the film. We sit down with these guys, talk about like, you know, what they want to do and how can we help them, and we take it from there. The worst case scenario is if someone just says, all right, I want this, and we just do it, which is you know, fine, but the best thing is to help them create something new. So are we around 20 minutes? All right, everyone falling asleep, nice. I'll just say a few words about this. It's the Avengers Age of Ultron. Have you seen it? Only one guy. Two guys. Three. Nice. Um, well, we know Marvel, uh, and they do very big Hollywood blockbusters with all the you know, explosions and Robert Downey Jr. and people like that. Um, which is a really, really fun thing to do if you are involved in this kind of thing. Um, I'm not talking about the film itself, I'm just going to talk about how we worked on it. So, there was Avengers, the original one, that was Marvel's biggest film ever. It was, I think, one of the few films that crossed the one billion dollar limit, which is like, I, I can't even understand it, how much money there is. So. That's quite a lot, it seems. So there were very high expectations about the film, and um, we came from the Guardians of the Galaxy. We did that before, we, we, which was, compared to the Avengers, it was a much smaller film. Um, and based on the, the ideas we had in that film, we were asked to do this. And the production designer and the art department team was the same on the Avengers. Um, so we had a very good working relationship with them. And what we had to do at the end was basically 80 minutes of animation and roughly 200 screens. And we worked on it for like nine months. That's quite a lot. Uh, quite a lot of time to spend with Iron Man and the Hulk and the rest of them. So let me just play you the real, which we did. That's the Avengers one.
so that was that was basically what we did for the Avengers. Lots of uh, flashy stuff, interesting bits. I just, just for a second, I saw a tweet about Bash scripts and Ex Machina. Uh, you know, you have to see the film to see what's in there. What you saw there was just slab frames. So I, I, I don't want to, I don't want you guys to think that those guys who did the actual sort of like code are. I don't know if it's a good thing at all if was if it was a bad script. So I just want to have all base covered. So just very quickly because I'm I'm seeing that we are getting out of time. Um, these are some concept stuff that we got from the Marvel people. It's amazing, you know. They have these rooms full of concept art, and then they just you know tell you that we want to have something for Iron Man and and Doctor Chow, and they build these huge sets. And it's really interesting to be a part of that. And I'll show you this slide because this shows how we work, actually. So when we created the star frames and they are approved, we create hundreds of these little widgets and little things. We build libraries from them. Um, and the reason for that is when each character has their own little library, we can do very quick iterations, we can do like new screens in, 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 you know, much less time than it would take to design everything from scratch. So that's, that's the very first step after everything was approved to build this library of um, little stuff. Let me show you how, you know, this is, this is a, sc a screen that starts there, that was for, for Tony Stark. And the reason why I'm showing you this is it shows the sheer variety of screens that we did. And what we did here is you have the, the pinkish, bluish ones that was for one set. And we have the Iron Man ones, which are the orange and blue ones. And we have the green ones, which are obviously for the Hulk. So it's very easy to, to create these different worlds. Um, and this is very easy for the director to sort of like, all right, I want that set, and that stands out, please change it. So that's what we did on Iron Man. Let me show you how actually it works, just to break down. There's a very nice 3D model that we sort of like dissect and render in different passes, and then we just pull everything together. And the reason for that, the reason for rendering it in passes is we can use various parts for various purposes. If you want to do a new screen, we don't have to re-render everything. We just you know, use part of the original render, and then we do a new screen. Here's another breakdown. That's, uh, that's an arm. Obviously, there's some issues going on with the fingers, but this is not a human arm. I don't know if you've guessed it, but this is something else. So this is how it works. We just do all this 3D visage with it, particles, different topological lines, different tessellations, and then using that library I showed you before, we just build these screens around it. So that's one, one screen. If the director wants to change something, we use a different 3D asset, use different little widgets, and then you have another screen immediately. So, because we are running out of time, just very quickly, just to, you know, sort of like sum everything up. Um, what we do here is we are supporting the story. We, we obviously really like to have that, lo that little moment when we can sort of like shine and show that this is a really nice interface that we designed and we worked on it for months. But this is not about it. This is about supporting the story that the director wants to tell, supporting the story that the film is about. We always come up with new things. We never reuse stuff because uh, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be caught. So if you did something for another film, and you know it's very easy to use it for another film, we don't we don't do that, and it's much harder to do, and it takes more time. But we we are really keen on not doing that. Um, it is very hard work. What's not hard work? Everything is hard work, but this is really hard work. Lots of hours. It's not as glamorous as you would think. And the main reason for this is we love film. We love helping telling these stories. Um, and if we, we are able to, 
to help the director to tell that, that, that story. We're really happy to do it. And just to finish, this is basically a very quick sum up of what we did in the past couple of years. So that was it. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much. I hope it helped to tell a little bit more about what we do. Um, and I know that we don't have a Q&A session, but if you have any questions, I'll be around here. So just feel free to ask. Um, and if you have anything to write, just write to my email address. Thank you very much for having us here. and. Cheers, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot.